Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. Psychologist, author, speaker, musician, former professor, and the host of Love and Life, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Welcome to Dr. Karen Love and Life. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Today we're bringing you part two of my conversation with esteemed physician and psychologist, Dr. Leonard Sachs. He's a parenting expert and the author of four books, The Collapse of Parenting, Boys Adrift, Girls on the Edge, and Why Gender Matters. If you didn't get the chance to listen to the first portion of our conversation, please check out episode 33, I Just Want My Kids to Be Happy, and Other Flawed Parenting Ideals. In this episode, Dr. Sachs explains why trying to make your kids happy actually makes them less happy, and why parenting truly is much harder nowadays than it was 30 years ago. Spoiler alert, it's not just about technology. In part one of our conversation, Dr. Sachs also discusses what he calls the collapse of parenting. And in part two, he addresses the ramifications of this collapse. As he puts it, When parents abdicate responsibility and authority, you create a vacuum, and American doctors and pharmaceutical companies have stepped into that vacuum. He further explains why the astronomical increase in diagnoses of ADHD, bipolar, depression, and anxiety is strictly an American phenomenon and an American parenting problem. Dr. Sachs explains more here. Uh, An American kid is now 14 times more likely to be on medication for attention deficit disorder compared to a kid in the United Kingdom. An American kid is now 39 times more likely to be diagnosed with pediatric bipolar disorder compared to a kid in Germany. An American kid is now 93 times more likely to be on antipsychotic medication like Seroquel, Risperdal, Zyc. Zyprexa compared to a kid in Italy. Uh, And 30 years ago, there was very little difference in psychiatric prescribing between the United States and these other countries. Over the last 30 years, the United States has gone from being a leader to being an outlier. Kids in this country are now much more likely, factors of 10, factors of 50, more likely to be diagnosed with psychiatric disorders compared to kids in Scotland, in Switzerland, in Germany, in New Zealand. And yet, Very few people in this country are even aware of that fact, which I devote a chapter to in The Collapse of Parenting. Very few Americans are even aware of that. Very few are asking the question, why? Why is the United States now a much worse country for raising children on a wide variety of outcomes compared to Scotland, compared to Switzerland, compared to New Zealand? Well, and also another point that you bring up that I think is related to that is this cultural shift away from personal responsibility. So I think parents are much more willing to accept a diagnosis of bipolar, which wasn't even in existence when I was getting my master's in the mid 90s. For children anyway, bipolar existed. But That's right. Pediatric bipolar disorder. The diagnosis of pediatric bipolar disorder increased 40 fold between between 1994 and 2007. 40 times as many kids in the United States in 2007 being diagnosed with pediatric bipolar disorder compared to 1994. But I also think that had to do with the fact that people wanted to medicate kids with tantrums. I don't think they were really exhibiting the full fluctuations of mood. Well, certainly the the true uh, uh, diagnosis, uh, the Germans actually have a paper where they compare Germany to the United States. Um, and they, when I do this presentation for parents, I'll sometimes attempt a German accent as I quote <laughs> from the paper. And, and the final paragraph reads something like, it is very unlikely that the uh, American children are actually 39 times more likely to have bipolar disorder. It is more likely that the American doctors just do not understand how to diagnose this condition correctly. Uh, and I think the Germans are right. Uh, I think mm-hmm. that when parents abdicate responsibility and abdicate re- authority, you create a vacuum. Mm-hmm. And doctors, American doctors, have stepped into that vacuum. Right. So the child who is disrespectful, the 14-year-old who throws ta- tantrums and throws things, 30 years ago, a parent or a school principal might have said, 
your kid is rude. He's defiant. He's disrespectful. You, you need to take some responsibility here and step up. Instead, that teacher, that principal is now in this country much more likely to say, uh, you know, your child is exhibiting some behavior. So have you thought of having him evaluated? Of course, the parents take him to the psychiatrist who says, well, you know, uh, researchers at, uh, like Dr. Joseph Biederman at Harvard have suggested that these kind of temper tantrums uh, can actually be a sign of pediatric bipolar disorder. So why don't you put your kid on the Seroquel or Zyprexa? Let's try some Seroquel and see if it helps. Incidentally, Dr. Biederman at Harvard didn't tell anyone that he was accepting millions of dollars uh, from the drug companies that he was not publicly disclosing. He was functioning as a paid spokesperson for the drug companies, a point I explain at some length in the book. And he is not the only one uh, in the United States. Quite a few leaders in this country uh, have played this game where they accept millions of dollars from drug companies and then speak from their perch at the distinguished university without telling us. And broke no law. There's no law in the United States preventing doctors from accepting millions of dollars from drug companies. Uh, his action was unethical. He should have told us that he was function that he was getting way more money from the drug companies than he was from Harvard. But in any case, when parents abdicate authority, it creates a vacuum. And into that vacuum, the doctor with the prescription pad has stepped. And as a prescribing physician and psychologist, I've had parents in this situation uh, come to me. And I'm fighting against the whole weight of American culture and the medical, pharmaceutical, industrial complex. Best illustrated by a story a mother told me, her husband contractor, civilian contractor for the United States uh, Department of Defense, and was assigned to England for four years to work with American military jointly with the uh, British military. And so for four years, their son was in English uh, state schools, uh, public schools, because there were no schools at the base. And then they returned to this country after four years, came back here to Pennsylvania. And mom told me within weeks, it was like there was a conspiracy. Everyone started saying to her, you know, your son's such a bright boy, uh, but he's only getting average marks. Have you thought of having him evaluated? This never happened in England. Never once in four years did anyone suggest that she go and get her son a prescription for Vyvanse or Adderall. But within weeks of returning to the United States, that teachers and then parents were saying to her, well, you know, my kid's been doing so much better since he got this uh, prescription for Vyvanse, for Adderall. And in the book, I share research showing that these stimulant medications like Vyvanse, like Adderall, boost achievement for normal kids as much or more than they do for kids with ADD. There's nothing specific about it. These are performance enhancers. They're stimulants. And so many American parents are confused on this point. Again, another family I had their daughter had been doing well right through ninth grade. Then in 10th grade, her grades went off the deep end and she's not doing well. And they took her to the doctor who prescribed Vyvanse and seemed to help a lot in school. But now she's getting tremors and palpitations. They saw something I'd written for the New York Times about the risks of these medications. So they brought her in to see me for a second opinion. And I said to this girl, are there any screens in your bedroom? Any? Do you have a cell phone in your bedroom? She said, well, of course I have my phone. I said, do you ever look at your phone at night? She said, oh yeah, I, I have it on. And, uh, and mom, incidentally, is totally unaware of this. This Mom is hearing this for the first time in the doctor's office, that her daughter routinely is on Instagram at two in the morning. And she's sleep deprived. She's getting maybe five, six hours of sleep a night. She needs nine. Vyvanse, what's Vyvanse? What's Adderall? They're amphetamines. They're prescription stimulants. They compensate for the sleep deprivation. So yeah, she's doing much better, but the appropriate remedy for sleep deprivation is sleep, not schedule two prescription stimulants. And what this kid needs is for the parent to turn the phone off and put it in the charger in the parent's bedroom at nine o'clock at night so the girl can get some sleep. Uh, and when we did that, this girl is doing much better and she's off the medication. Hi, I'm Michelle from Valparaiso, Indiana, and I listen to Dr. Karen Love and Life. You also bring up some of the recent longitudinal studies that are showing the damage to the nucleus accumbens. So talking now about these medications prescribed for attention deficit disorder, most popular 
uh, medications in this country are Vyvanse, Adderall, Concerta, Metadate, Focal, and Detrano. It turns out that all these medications damage the motivational center of the developing brain, which is the nucleus accumbens. And I present 14 scholarly references demonstrating that finding, not only in laboratory animals, but also in humans. And yet most American prescribing physicians are not aware of those studies. And that goes back to something rotten in American medicine, which is that so much of American medicine is corrupted by drug company money. I'm like other doctors. I get my continuing medical education going to conferences. My family and I went to Rocky Mountain National Park, where eight in the morning till one o'clock in the afternoon, you'd have your conference and then you're free the rest of the day to go do fun stuff with your family. You know, I do that. And I actually don't see anything wrong with that as long as the education is good is sound. Problem is that a lot of these CME programs, continuing medical education programs, are funded by drug companies, sometimes in ways that are not obvious even to the doctor. I got a flyer from Harvard Medical School saying, come to this great conference uh, on best practice in evaluation and management of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, hosted by the renowned Dr. Joseph Biederman. The same Dr. Joseph Biederman, I might add, who has admitted taking millions of dollars from the drug companies, and he was never punished by Harvard. He is still director of research in child psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and still hosting these conferences, but he is functioning, as I said, as a paid spokesperson for the drug companies, and the doctor wouldn't even know this unless you study up on who Joseph Biederman is and what his history is, and who's going to do that? Come on, we're doctors, we're busy, we're not going to spend our time Googling the host of the conference. So that's a problem with American medicine. And the long-term effects, if I remember correctly from the research that you presented, is that then the motivational center of the brain is, is damaged. So this effort to increase motivation and increase attention and focus, which is rampant on college campuses, by the way, a lot of colleges are now having programs where they're essentially diagnosing kids. I mean, and the diagnosis for ADHD is ridiculous anyway, because it's a free for all. I mean, anyone could be categorized as ADHD if they were in any kind of situation where they weren't very motivated or interested. The diagnostic criteria, if applied, are valid. One of the diagnostic criteria is onset of significant symptoms prior to 12 years of age. And that's really important. ADHD is a diagnosis of childhood. Uh, Before it got its name ADHD in 1980, it was termed hyperkinetic reaction of childhood. That was the name of this condition. It was defined as a childhood condition. It was uh, uh, clear that kids outgrow this and that as adults, they will not have it. Then Dr. Joseph Biederman came along and he said, no, actually, nobody outgrows ADHD. Almost everyone will have to stay on medication as adults. And he didn't tell us that he was being paid millions of dollars by the drug companies selling those medications. Dr. Biederman is wrong. The great majority of kids with ADHD will outgrow it. And the diagnostic criteria are correct. Namely, you have to have onset of significant impairment prior to 12 years of age. What's happening is a lot of kids do great in elementary school, middle school, high school, get into a highly selective college, and now they're at college, they're staying up till two in the morning, uh, partying or on Instagram or playing video games, they're sleep deprived, and suddenly they find it very difficult to concentrate and focus. And someone gives them a Connors scale, and they're off the chart. They're inattentive in every domain. Well, You know, I corresponded with Dr. Connors, the creator of the Connors Scale, before his recent death, and he would be the first person to tell you the Connors Scale is not a diagnostic instrument. It is not a substitute for a clinician getting a careful history. Okay, this kid's not paying attention. Yeah, why are they not paying attention? Maybe it's because they only got two hours of sleep last night. You must exclude sleep deprivation as the cause of the inattention. And if you didn't have onset of symptoms before 12 years of age, you don't have ADHD. Again, recently, Dr. Biederman has been pushing this notion of adult onset ADHD, which turns Mm -hmm. out to be without evidentiary basis. Uh, We can now say confidently based on the research, there's no such thing as adult onset ADHD. 
ADHD means onset of significant impairment prior to 12 years of age. Those are the criteria. That's the important, that's the criteria we're talking about. And this kid who suddenly is now not paying attention at 19 years of age, that's a real problem. And we need to figure out why. But don't tell me ADHD. This kid was a a straight A student right through their senior year at high school. They don't have ADHD. There's something else going on. Maybe it's sleep deprivation. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's depression. Uh, Anxiety and depression can perfectly mimic ADHD, but If this kid is super anxious and having trouble paying attention for that reason, you need to understand the causes of their anxiety, which has exploded uh, in American teenagers, particularly among girls. And much of that is related to social media from the research that I've come across, the the comparison game that's getting played, that every girl knows what every other girl in her class is doing at any given time based on all the selfies that are being posted. That's right. You shared a story that was very troubling to me, and I, I wish you would share it with the listeners, if you don't mind, about a young man who I think was about 28 years old or so, living in his parents' oh, yes. home yet. <laughs> that was, okay. It was alarming, yeah. So mom is getting pretty upset with her son, and she says to him, you know, you roll out of bed late every morning, you work a few hours a week at the coffee shop, you spend most of your free time playing video games, you're 28 years old. You don't have a life. Uh, You don't even have a girlfriend. And he laughed. He said, well, I used to have a girlfriend. Then she found out I only work out a few hours a week at Starbucks. She dumped me. Mom is pulling her hair out. Son is perfectly happy with his 55-inch flat screen and his uh, pornography and his video games. Mom insisted he come talk to me. He was fine with that. He was telling me about his girlfriend, said some very unkind things about her. He said uh, he said she was fat. She wanted me to take her places, do stuff. He said, nineteen ninety five a month. I said, wait, I don't understand. What do you mean nineteen ninety five a month? And he mentioned a porn site. He said it's only nineteen ninety five a month, and he said the girls are way prettier. I said, Wait, wait, <laughs> those aren't girls. Those are pictures. They're pixels on a computer screen. Wouldn't wouldn't you rather be intimate with an actual woman rather than masturbate over pornography? And he said, no, Uh, this boy was on Ritalin from nine to 17 years of age. Um, Ritalin is methylphenidate. It's the active ingredient in Concerta, Metadate, Folkland, Detrana. That's the end result. That's what you get. Uh, when you damage the nucleus accumbens over a period of years, you get a boy who is not motivated. He's funny. He's friendly. He Look, the nucleus accumbens has nothing to do with cognition or social interaction. It has to do with motivation. You damage the motivational center. This boy is still funny, still friendly, but he's completely unmotivated. He's perfectly content to sit in his bedroom looking at porn and playing video games. That was so alarming to me when I heard that. And I thought, it's one of those things where you think, just kick him out. But (laughs) I'm sure the parents are thinking, he can't hold down a job. He will be in an alley somewhere. He will be homeless. He will be homeless. And I have, you know, I've been counseling parents for many years. And I had this very conversation uh, with a parent. The most depressing, discouraging email I get is the email from the parent who says, my son is not working. He's not looking for work. He plays video games uh, and looks at porn all day long. He is 32 years old. He's living in our basement. What do I do? Look, I give advice based either on my clinical experience of what works and or based on scholarly research. I don't guess. And I have nothing to offer that parent. There is no intervention that is reliably effective in that context for a 32 year old man. The one intervention I've seen is to say, you have 30 days, either get a job or you're no longer welcome in this house. But I was with a parent uh, and advising a parent who followed that advice. And then we changed it to 60 days and then we changed it to 90 days. And at the end of 90 days, the kid still had no job and no real interest in finding a job. And the parent kicked her son out of the house and he became homeless. Oh, my. It's very difficult for a parent to go to sleep at night knowing that your child is homeless on the streets. So I have nothing to offer those parents. Look, we have a lot of studies now of brain development in children 
We know that girls reach full maturity in terms of brain development by about 22 years of age. Turns out boys don't reach full maturity in brain development until about 30 years of age. So that explains, that, that mm-hmm. explains a lot if you think about <laughs> it. So I am very comfortable advising uh, parents of children and teenagers. I've been doing it for 30 years. Uh, I've seen what works and what doesn't work. There's a lot of evidence that can guide my recommendations. If a parent comes in with concerns about her 15-year-old son, I am very confident making specific and concrete recommendations because he's 15 years old. He's got another 15 years to go. To understand the importance of this brain research, imagine that you're baking a cake and you put the cake in the oven and you realize, oh my goodness, I forgot the vanilla extract. Okay, take it out of the oven. It's still liquid. You can put the vanilla extract and stir it in, stir it around and put it back in and it will be a better cake because you remembered to put in the vanilla extract even at the last minute. But suppose the cake is baked. Suppose the cake is baked and you take it out of the oven and you say, oh, I forgot to put in the vanilla extract. And now you sprinkle vanilla extract over the baked cake. You're not going to make it better. You're going to make it worse. The 32-year-old is cooked. (laughs) Uh, His cake is baked. Uh, Yeah, Mm -hmm. I know. I've read all the research about neuroplasticity, but the plasticity of the brain of a 32-year-old is very small compared to the brain of a 15-year-old. If this 32-year-old has 15 years of spending his free time playing video games and looking at porn, 15 years of being on Adderall, Vyvanse, Concerta, Metadate, the odds that you're going to reverse that at 32 years of age are not good. That's why I'm so passionate about speaking to parents of children and teenagers, because once this kid is 32 years of age, I don't have much to offer. Right. Yes, exactly. And just speaking on the technology and the gaming and the so forth, but you have just come across uh, from what I remember from the seminar I attended, some of the longitudinal studies that are just being released that really connect a lot of what we're seeing in addition to all the cultural realities that we've mentioned, but also the smartphone Really, the iPhone showed up in about 2007, I believe. Yes. And at that point, we're seeing a dramatic shift. And I, I can't remember the name of the researcher yes. that you mentioned, but she... Jean Twenge. Yes. Jean Twenge, T-W-E-N-G-E. She's the key researcher here looking at databases. So, for example, American researchers have been asking American teenagers exactly the same questions about uh, anxiety, depression, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep, Uh since 1991, a large and demographically representative sample of American teenagers. And the researchers do this every year, talking to 15-year-olds and 17-year-olds each year. And so that allows us to compare across time. So you look at anxiety and depression for American boys from 1991 through 2016, there's very little change. And the same is true for American girls from 1991 through 2010. But then in 2010, something weird happens. And the rate of anxiety and depression among American girls skyrockets in a way totally without parallel for the boys. And it's continuing. And there's no taper in that trend line. It's just going straight up practically on a graph that's going back 25 years. What happened in 2010? What happened in 2010? Instagram happened. Instagram and other apps like it. It turns out that girls are using social media in ways that enormously increase the risk of anxiety and depression among girls, but not among boys. Let me just quickly share with you, because Jean Twenge actually doesn't go into those differences. She's the great expert at documenting the shift over time in anxiety and depression. But when you get to the question of why, how are girls using social media differently? This is where I pull together a variety of research from different So, for example, I I met with Kathy Charles at Napier University. She and others, other researchers have found that when you follow girls across time, you find the more time they spend on Instagram or apps like Instagram, the more likely they are to become depressed or anxious. And that's a much bigger effect for girls than it is for boys. And they document this. But when I met with Kathy Charles at her office at Napier University, she didn't know why. She couldn't explain the gender effect in her own Uh, study, why is the use of social media so much more likely to be associated with anxiety and depression in girls than it is among boys? So I shared with her research from other 
investigators showing that girls are very ready to believe that other girls are having more fun than they are, that other girls' lives are more interesting than their own life is. Mm -hmm. This turns out to be not at all true for boys. turns out that boys greatly overestimate how interesting their own life is to other people. And girls and boys use social media differently. So a girl and a boy both get sick. They both throw up. The boy posts a photo of his own vomit on his Instagram. Girls never do that. <laughs> and girls are more invested in their social media. So a boy and a girl both go to a football game. They both take pictures at the game. But the boy is taking a picture of the game or of the pretty cheerleader at the game. The girl is turning the phone on herself, and she's taking 100 selfies at the game. And then that evening, she's going through the 100 selfies, and she's finding two or three where she's laughing. The kids around her are laughing. And that's what she posts on her Instagram. Here I am at the game. We had a great time. You know, if, if you don't like Jacob's photo of the pretty cheerleader, he doesn't care. But if you don't like Sonia's photo of Sonia, she's going to take it personally. So girls are more invested in social media. Uh, girls post a much narrower sliver of their lived experience. They post the fun stuff, the happy stuff. They don't post the vomit. And girls are very ready to believe that other girls are having more fun than they are. So imagine this girl sitting in her bedroom looking at everybody, else, all the other girls' Instagram. There's Emily at the party. She's having a great time. There's Sonia at the game. She's having a blast. I'm just sitting in her, here in my bedroom, not doing anything. My life sucks. This boy looking at Jacob's vomit or Brett's dead dog is less likely to want to be Jacob or Brett. And this boy already greatly overestimated how interesting his own life is to begin with. And he spends much less time on social media and is less invested in social media than the girl is. So social media turn out to be much more toxic for girls than they are for boys. Well, and those are such important distinctions for parents to understand the technology and how their kids are going to relate to it differently based on their gender. Yeah. My, uh, my latest book, if you like, is the new edition of my book, Why Gender Matters. It came out uh, 12 years ago, published by Doubleday, the first edition. That first edition had no mention of social media because I wrote the book in 2004, okay? Mark Zuckerberg launched Facebook in 2004. So social media, as we know today, really barely existed in 2004. This has all happened very quickly. The new edition published a few months ago of Why Gender Matters has a whole chapter on sex differences in social media where I present this research and help parents to understand why social media is more toxic for girls than it is for boys. You must limit, govern, and guide what your kids are doing online. You must limit, govern, and guide how much time your son is spending on video games. Uh, again, these are topics I didn't address in the first uh, edition. I mean, 20 years ago, uh, video games, you know, was space invaders. Uh, right. Or 30 years ago, I would be more accurate. But 20 years ago, it was very rare to find boys who were truly addicted to video games. Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, Assassin's Creed didn't exist back then. The technology could not have supported games like that online. Uh, today, it's common to find boys who are addicted to video games. Again, the new edition of Why Gender Matters presents that research and very concrete guidelines about what parents must know about how boys are using video games, how girls are using social media. Hi, this is Bruni Getchell, life coach and clinical hypnotherapist from Boston, Massachusetts, and I listen to Dr. Karen's podcast, Love and Life. You get into some of that in Boys Adrift as well, which I thought was really important yes. because you look at the moral development because some of these games, the entire goal of the game is to be <laughs> anti-moral or amoral or or evil. <laughs> uh, that's true of some yeah. games more than others. Grand Theft Auto being the, the great example of the game that really in, deploys what the researchers call a moral inversion, meaning that in Grand Theft Auto, good is bad and bad is good. And killing police officers is good, including police officers you've never met who've done nothing to you just to get their weapons. Uh, killing prostitutes to get your money back from them is good. So uh, Grand Theft Auto has a completely inverted morality where killing innocent people is uh, often rewarded. And it turns out that engaging in that kind of game, not in an hour or in a week, but over months, over years, changes the personality of the kid playing the game. And again, we have a good launch, we have several good longitudinal cohort studies demonstrating that finding. So yeah, parents must know what games their son is playing and they must limit, govern and guide what games their son is playing. Well, just to conclude, and thank you so much for your time and, and your expertise and all this research. And it's so important. And I do hope that parents will feel encouraged because it, it can feel a little dismal and bleak. And, and as you're saying, there's so many challenges that just 
weren't there years ago. So parents, they can't even look to their own parenting that they received for, yeah. as a model for some of this. They're, they're kind of on a learning curve and, and we're, I, I think parents are all learning together. But just to, to conclude, can you share with listeners where to find you, your website, and then also if there's anything else you wanted to share with them, I, I'd love you to do that now. Sure. So listeners can connect with me uh, at my website, which is Leonard Sachs, L-E-O-N-A-R-D-S-A-X dot com. Uh, just click on contact me. And I also try to post my upcoming events at least a few weeks in advance there. If you'd like to come hear me speak and you're in the area. When I have only a few minutes with parents, my strongest recommendation to parents is to prioritize the family. Make the family meal a priority. That may mean canceling other activities. That's okay. The family meal is more important than your son having a play date, than your daughter going to computer coding class. And that's not a guess. Again, I've got a lot of research demonstrating that. When you're in the car with your child, no earphones allowed, no headsets allowed. When you're in the car, that's special time. That's precious time. It's private. You should be listening to her and she should be listening to you, not to Justin Bieber or Miley Cyrus. Prioritize the family. Don't be afraid to do things differently. Uh, the original title of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, the original title was The Collapse of American Parenting. And the subtitle was Why Most Kids Would Now Be Better Off Raised outside North America. But non-celebrity authors don't get to choose their title, and the publisher didn't like that title. So that's not the title of the book as it was published. But a lot of parents would say, look, my kid just pushes back so hard. When I said, I'm going to take your phone, she said, all the other kids have their phone. And it seems like she's telling the truth. Because when I looked at her text messages at two in the morning, there's 20 kids who are texting her at two in the morning. Basically, all the kids she knows at school are up at two in the morning texting. So how can I be the only parent to take my kid's phone? If you're going to raise a child in the United States, you have to have courage to do things differently. Because if you do things the same, as other American parents, the odds are very good that your child is going to become anxious, depressed, disengaged, or all of the above. If you're going to live here and raise a child, you have to have the courage to do things differently. It reminds me of the notion of tough love, but I think it's really just love. I think it's really just love. And again, a chapter of the book is titled Enjoy, which sounds banal. The message there is enjoy the time you have with your kid. But so many American parents, and this is more true of affluent parents, they are sucked into this notion that my kid's got to get into a highly selective college. And so they're spending their free time with their kid, drilling the kid on homework. Don't do that. What's most important is the quality of your relationship with your child. And if you're spending your free time drilling your kid on homework, and that's all you do, that's not building a good relationship. You have to ensure that you're having fun with your child. So go for that bike ride on the bike path together. Go for a hike together. Go to the ski resort together. And when your daughter asks if she's allowed to bring her best friend along, the answer is no, she's not. Because if she brings her best friend to the ski resort, it's going to be her and her best friend going up on the chairlift. It needs to be you and her on the chairlift. If it's her and her best friend on the chairlift, all you've done is pay for a very expensive play date. And that's not what she needs. The point of the vacation is to strengthen the bond, to strengthen the love between you and your child. And in order for that to happen, you two have to do a lot of fun stuff together. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Dr. Sachs. It's been a real pleasure talking with you, and I really appreciate your mission and your message, and I, I know that it's going to empower and encourage many parents, so thank you very much. Thanks so much for inviting me. So the love and life hack for this week is limit, govern, and guide your kids. Dr. Sachs repeated this phrase several times throughout the episode, and every time we have that temptation to give in to our kids when we know we really shouldn't, remember it is the job of a parent to limit, to govern, and to guide. Because if kids don't get that from you, where are they going to get it? For more information on the research that substantiates Dr. Sachs's points, please check out his books, The Collapse of Parenting, Boys Adrift, Girls on the Edge, and Why Gender Matters. This is Dr. Karen anderson Abril. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time... Make it a great week.
Dr. Karen Love and Life is produced by Chip Gregory, senior producer Michelle Musso, and host and executive producer Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. 